welcome to the Global AI Podcast. We are coming to you from the second Global AI Summit emanating from Riyadh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And today we have a very special guest with us who is an author of a book called Food and Tech, if I'm not mistaken, JC Anthes. Thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure to be here. The book's on the end of animal farming, but it okay. is about food technology. All right. Well, can you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, authoring books about you know, artificial intelligence and technology and different aspects of life? Yeah, so my career has been studying social change and technological change. There are a lot of commonalities when we see the rise and sometimes fall of different tech. So, for example, you can look back at genetically modified foods in the 90s and, and see the way it started to catch on, but then consumers rejected it and activists started opposing it and pushed back, and then it didn't take off the way people expected it to. Mm -hmm. Or you can look at nuclear energy, which sort of succeeded in some industry, uh, some regions and failed okay. in others. So France took it on. They saw it as a solution to their energy crisis, 19 1973, whereas places like the U.S. saw it under Three Mile Island and nuclear waste and pushed back against the technology. So a lot of the questions I like to ask and sometimes answer are around what will happen with artificial intelligence, where will it take off, where will it not take off, what are the pitfalls, what are the things to look out for, what are the complications. Okay. And where do you see artificial intelligence going in the future, especially since, you know, one of the summits, uh, the summit's themes is AI Next. AI is what we call a general purpose technology or a GPT. So there's a long history in economic research of studying uh, conjunctive curves or these technologies that are an industrial revolution, the first, the second, the third, and now potentially the fourth. So these are technologies that can have feedback loops. So they go into society and increase our ability to create new technologies, which means they're really um, ubiquitous in their impact on okay. society and on industries. There's really nothing that will go untouched. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of expectations, I think, in the 1900s about what would be displaced by artificial intelligence. Uh, there's something called Moravex Law. So the idea that what we thought was easy turned out to be very hard. Okay. What we thought was hard turned out to be easy. So for example, a lot of robotics and in fact, things like grip have been very challenging. So here at the summit, there are robots that make Saudi coffee for you and they grip on two sides of a bottle and squeeze it tight and are able to lift and pour. But it's been really challenging to build robots that can grip in an Amazon warehouse, grip whole boxes and move them around and that sort of thing. Okay. So we're still figuring out where it works best. You know, some areas like uh, expert systems and the management of organizations that people were very excited about in the late 1900s have struggled more. Really where we see a lot of success is uh, image processing, language processing, sound processing, and other areas of seeking out patterns from large amounts of very high dimensional data. Right. So if we need to translate, if we need to recognize images, that's where it is now. I think it's going to go everywhere, but that, those are the biggest changes in the 2010s and probably the 2020s. Okay, and where do you see uh, artificial intelligence playing a pivotal role in certain sectors or industries? I think some big industries right now are uh, supply chains, so anything that involves something like sorting. Um, so there's an example in, I believe, Japan of a small company had somebody who learned machine learning online, uh, took the courses, learned how to build a neural network, and then sorted cucumbers. So okay. this like machine vision problem of they want to very quickly figure out what the good produce is, the good food, uh, away from the bad ones, sort it out with some sort of robotics or machinery. Um, so a lot of industries that rely on some sort of sorting and classification like that. Mm -hmm. I think here at the summit, we've seen examples from energy. We've seen examples from smart cities and from construction and things like that. Of course, there are famous social examples. So areas like criminal justice and assessing you know, risk. Um, there was an example here, I believe, maybe in Seoul of at construction sites, you know, using machine vision to see who's going to be uh, at risk of an accident, you know, okay. if a machine is left on or something. So I think all of these big pattern detection problems in construction, energy, food, the list could go on and on. Okay. All right. Uh, fair enough. Um, with, uh, the f with the summit's overarching theme is artificial intelligence for the better of humanity. Um, from your, you know, experience and just what you research, where do you see that um, artificial intelligence is significantly impacting humanity. Yeah, so there are both challenges and opportunities here. I think, for example, we've become very aware of the problem of bias, but not just in the algorithms themselves. So humans, when we make decisions, especially around other humans, are very biased. There are a lot of things that subconsciously affect things, even if we're trying to be the best person we can be. Okay. Algorithms have their own issues of bias, but they're good at identifying and understanding and being transparent about those disparities so that we can better understand them and become 
fairer. So, for example, in an area like criminal justice, uh, human judges, there's a famous study where they get hungry around lunch. And, you know, there's this replication crisis in sociology. I don't know how this holds up, but they seem to be uh, stricter. So they are crueler, assign more criminal sentencing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, longer terms uh, when they're hungry right before they, they depart for lunch. Okay. So the algorithms can help us be fair in those contexts. I think more generally, as these algorithms are being applied across different industries, they're speeding up forms of human progress that will benefit us overall. You know, we face a lot of crises today as a society, things like the climate crisis, mm -hmm. um, energy issues, where any improvement in renewable energy and, and wind or, or solar or what have you right. is going to speed things up. So by virtue of improving these supply chains and things like that, if that's applied, you know, it's, it's a tool like any other technology. If that tool is applied to the right areas, it'll be for the betterment of humanity. Okay. And, uh, you know, with, with the more use of artificial intelligence in our day-to-day -day lives, there's a, you know, um, a need for basically evaluating the artificial intelligence ethics. And, uh, you know, from all the guests that I've been speaking to, it you know, kind of varies from culture to culture and from time to time. So where do you see, where do you see the ethics of AI going? Mm. To return to the example of, of bias or fairness, um, that's a very challenging area because it's not clear exactly what we mean by that. We have ideas of, of equity and equality in various metrics. So computer scientists have put forth a few definitions of what it means for an algorithm to be fair. They all sound intuitive. So for example, one demographic parity would be you're equal in what the algorithm tells you about a person regardless of their protected class. So regardless of their race or gender or nationality or whatever you want to be fair across. That's one definition. There are many others mm -hmm. and different values assign different weights to these. And it's very unclear how to adjudicate between those. So I think that's a real challenge and that's sort of the state of the art in the literature. I really like this big study that was done on autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars. Okay. So it was called the Moral Machine Project. Um, they surveyed people in different cultures all around the world to see how they would decide who in an emergency situation an autonomous vehicle would hit. So imagine you know, you're headed to a collision, there are some adults in the car, you could swerve and hit a fewer number of children or okay. a fewer number of elderly people. And you have to make these really tough decisions, who should you favor? And one finding from that was that in the West, uh, we tend to care more about children than about elderly people. Okay. In the East, uh, in China for example, you tend to care more about the elderly than the children. And that's a tough trade-off, and it's very unclear how we'll adjudicate between these different values. Will we have some auditing process that provides measures in each of these regards? You know, when we measure the performance of an algorithm, we have different measures. It's accuracy, um, other, other, you know, machine learning measures. Okay. And sorting between those is a really hard problem. That's both cultural, it's social, it's regulatory, and it's technical, coming up with those measures and, and figuring out what makes sense to provide to people in charge so they can make informed decisions based on their own cultural context. Okay, that's very interesting. And, uh, you know, the Global AI Summit is bringing together experts and entrepreneurs and decision makers from all around the world for one common bond, which is to collectively discuss how artificial intelligence will be used for the betterment of humanity. So what are your thoughts about, you know, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia hosting uh, the second Global AI Summit? Yeah, I love this broad approach, getting everyone in the same room together, uniting under some common goals, and also, as we discussed, sorting through some perhaps conflicting or at least values that are in tension. I think that is the future. I think we're running into a lot of challenges with AI that it's very unclear how we'll handle them. I think in particular, there's this idea of general artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So you have some models now like Gatto, where a single algorithm, a single neural network can do many different things. The same model might be able to do robotics. It can do language and speak to people. It can do vision and recognize things. And it's getting closer and closer to a sort of machine that we don't know how to handle and we've mm -hmm. imagined in science fiction for better or for worse. And I think getting everyone to have a seat at the table and think critically through that, think through what's called AI safety or AI alignment will be very important. This problem of aligning AI with human values, given we know so little about our values, given we know so little about these algorithms. So projects like interpretability, you know, understanding what's going on inside these neural networks, how are they making decisions, what protected classes might, might, might they be using, where do they get things right, where do they get things wrong. There's some great projects, for example, around getting the algorithm to tell you not just the answer it thinks is true, but it's sort of 
confidence in that answer? Does it think it's pretty likely to be right? You know, it's identifying a cat versus a dog and it's a clear example, or is it a harder example, something like facial recognition, where you're really not sure the person's wearing a mask, it might be them or it might not be? Getting them to express this and getting this dialogue, both between humans and other humans, between humans and algorithms, between humans and, and animals and the planet, and this broad picture, I think is where we need to go. And I think, I think the summon and I think the direction the kingdom is moving is towards a more united vision for a, a betterment of, of the future. Okay. And uh, what key takeaway do you hope to take with you from attending the summit? I've been astounded by the progress and I think the, the foresight that many different countries, and including the kingdom, are, are showing. Thinking about ethics first, for example, in the United States, where we've had discussions around what were originally called perceptrons or these neural networks since the 50s and 60s and even further back with these ideas of computation and replacing human intelligence, we started by thinking of them technically, you know, mathematically. Um, there's a Jurassic Park quote of, you know, they, they didn't stop to think whether they should, only whether they could uh, impose a technology on the world. And I'm excited to see a country that's right now very rapidly getting a foothold, getting started, joining these dialogues, talking about ethics at you know the summit, uh, talking about ethics at the beginning of the conversation and, and putting it in there, as opposed to an afterthought, which is often what it's felt like so far in the history of AI. Mm -hmm. But everyone's realizing that because these tools affect so many people and so many areas and so many industries there's no way around it just there's there's no such thing anymore as just doing the math or just building an algorithm everything's socio-technical and we've got to consider politics and governance and ethical challenges all right and uh i'd like to thank you very much for taking time to be with us on this episode and uh we're uh, out of time and uh, we appreciate uh, your explanation and uh, the time that you've taken to, to be here. It was my pleasure. All right. And uh, that's all for this episode. Tune in to our next episode of the Global AI Podcast. Goodbye.